Good evening, Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Litchfield State Fireside. I'm Sarah Kane, and it's a, an honour and a privilege to welcome you all this evening from wherever you're listening. Um, we are going to have an opening prayer um, from Sister Susie Piper of the Wolverhampton First Ward, and then I will introduce you all to our special guest this evening. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before thee at this time to give thanks for this day. We're grateful for the wonderful Sabbath day we've been able to have so far this day. And we're so grateful for the opportunity that we have now to listen to Sister Black, who's going to help us to have a conclusion and understanding of the Doctrine and Covenants. We're grateful for the um, Zoom and the ability that we have to be able to do this um, through technology. And we pray that the Spirit will be with us all as we listen and, and are ready to learn. And we pray for these things and give thanks for these things. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. Thank you, Susie. Um, so to um, officially introduce you to our special guest, I will read um, a short bio for you. Um, Dr. Susan Easton Black joined the faculty of Brigham Young University in 1978, where she was a professor of church history and doctrine at BYU for 32 years. She was the first woman hired as a full-time faculty member in the College of Religious Education. She is also past associate dean of general, general education and honors and director of church history and the religious studies center. The recipient of numerous academic awards, she received the Carl G. Mazur, Mazur Distinguished Faculty Lecturer Award in 2000, which is the highest award given a professor on the um, BYU Provo campus. Dr. Black has authored, edited, and compiled more than, uh, the bio I had was 100 books, but she's just told me it's 170 books and 250 articles. So um, I came across Sister Black um, on the Follow Him podcast, and I was just amazed. I think she's you've been on three times now, I think, haven't you? Um, and it's hosted by um, John, by the way, and, uh, and uh, Hank Smith. And when uh, Brother Smith called you Mrs. Nauvoo, I thought, oh, I love this woman already because I've been to Nauvoo only once, but it's one of my most favorite places in the world because it's just absolutely you can just feel the spirit there immediately as you walk in and i thought what a wonderful way for us to um wrap up and and just learn some more about church history from an absolute expert so i will now hand the time over to sister black we're so grateful to to have you speaking with us this evening thank you everybody hear me okay um my name is susan easton black I'm sitting in my library, and uh, the books you see, uh, for the most part, I've, I've written them. And uh, I thought maybe I should explain why I'd be willing to do this much work. You realize uh, some people have an amazing talent to sing. Uh, I do not. Other people are just beautiful dancers. I am not. Other people are great athletes <laughs> and uh, go to the Olympics and all those things. Well, I never did that. And so the question uh, perhaps is, uh, were you blessed and did you receive any gifts from my father in heaven? And one of the gifts I've always enjoyed was being a teacher. I started teaching at age 20 in a secondary school, history and geography, and loved it. And I just kept growing up with my students until uh, teaching in, uh, at the university level for literally decades. I continue to be a teacher. I'm now teaching at a school in Utah called Utah Valley University. I am privileged to teach in the Institute Pathway Program. And uh, what, what a blessing it is for me to meet with these wonderful students who for some reason or another um, decided to leave education, but with great enthusiasm have decided to come back. And uh, I hope you have the same experience in your state. Uh, it is a blessing literally through the world. 
Um, I'm a, a teacher in church. I teach the 14, 15 year olds in my ward. Don't you think that's fun? And uh, as far as uh, another assignment in the church, I'm currently writing the history of the BYU pathway program. I'm particularly interested in how that program is going worldwide and the blessing it's providing uh, to young people, old people, anybody in between uh, to learn about the gospel and to be able to move forward in life and have a happier life. Now, as far as my talent for writing, uh, I have been extremely blessed with opportunities and publishers to follow that opportunity. I have loved writing about the church. I'm just going to hold up the latest book so you'd say, yeah, that is the latest book. Uh, this one is about a man that was, uh, I understand, just in England with Elder Holland and Elder Cook. This is President M. Russell Ballard. And I don't know if you can see me on the bottom, but I was privileged to be able to interview him. Uh, his friends, apostles, associates, and what a wonderful man he is. I've also written... A lot on Jesus Christ. <laughs> okay. And, uh, you know, questionable, and you'll be able to say, yep, okay, that's her. But what I've written the most of, and, and I've actually written on uh, Olympics. So, but what I've written the most about is about the Prophet Joseph Smith and the Doctrine of Covenants. Of all the books that I've written on that topic, uh, the most uh, popular, meaning the most sold, it's called Who's Who in the Doctrine of Covenants. So the question that I'd like to address this evening, with all of these opportunities to learn, have, uh, have I gained wisdom? I mean, what, what have I really learned besides uh, Joseph Smith, uh, the people that knew him when you look up at the blue books behind me? Uh, that's the membership of the church that knew the prophet Joseph. There's 48,000 pages. Uh, the black books directly behind me. That's a uh, property that was bought and sold by Latter-day Saints in Nauvoo. Kind of the darker blue books next to them. That's everyone that did baptisms for the dead in Nauvoo. And, and so it goes. But the question is, in all of the learning, have I gained wisdom? And what have I learned that has affected my life for the better that I hope by sharing will give you an opportunity to reflect? I have learned uh, that in the Doctrine of Covenants, there's 130 plus people mentioned by name. And uh, most of the people mentioned by name are told to go on a journey which meant go on a mission, you know, um, accept a church calling. Some were called to um, priesthood offices. Others were chastised and asked to repent. And I became very curious. Well, did they go on a mission? Um, did they repent? Did they accept church assignments? And then the bigger issue for me as I get older was, did they stay faithful all their days? Or were they in and out? Uh, kind of like today they're in, the next day they choose not the church, the next day they're in, the next day they choose not. Did they leave the church and never return? And did they fight against the church? So what I learned uh, literally impacted my life for the better and helped me meet be stronger and a desire to keep the covenants of God. Uh, the first thing I learned was I could take all of the people mentioned in the Doctrine of Covenants and literally divide them into four categories. One category was uh, always faithful. In other words, you knew that individual would be at church no matter the weather, 
uh, even in sickness, if it wasn't too bad, he's coming. He's, you know, wherever he was, he would find a chapel. Anyway, I found that person. And then the second group of people, which actually were the largest in the Doctrine and Covenants, were those that, that fulfilled assignments, but for whatever reason, they stopped along the way and then, then they came back and then they stopped and, you know, it's like a seesaw back and forth. And then the third uh, group of people were those that left the church and, and never came back. I mean, no matter how much friendship, uh, I don't know, uh, cakes, pies, jellies, jams, whatever you're stopping by the house, no matter what happened, they, they just never chose to come back. And then the last group was uh, those that left the church, but they couldn't leave it alone and they fought against the church. And for me, I wanted to find out, well, how were their lives? I mean, were they happy? And uh, were their lives fulfilled? Uh, did, uh, did they pray? I mean, it was just all kinds of things. So you can imagine it what uh, the scene where you're seeing me sitting I really like research uh, there's hardly a day that I don't do something about research and so I decided to study are you curious I'd like to take you through these four groups and describe the blessings that they received because uh, in this time of pandemic where so many of us have been closed up more than we, we had ever thought possible in our lives. Um, what's, what's a takeaway that could bless our lives? Well, all right. The first thing that I discovered was uh, those that were always faithful, they had confidence. And I think, oh, that's amazing. <laughs> but I found consistent across the board they were blessed with a gift of confidence. So in other words, when asked to fulfill assignment, uh, they, they did. Um, maybe an example. We all know that Brigham Young uh, served as a prophet of the church after the death of the prophet Joseph. And uh, he, he was a great colonizer. Uh, he established uh, literally hundreds of small settlements in the Intermountain West of the United States. And he sent literally hundreds and hundreds of missionaries to England. Well, at the end of his life, to show his confidence, he called in his General Relief Society president, Eliza R. Snow. And he said to her, I'm, I'm gonna die soon and I would like to be buried in a pine box. But he said to Eliza, I'd like you to line that pine box with pink. Now, I think that's pretty interesting. I mean, a man would have to be confident to be able to want his casket lined with pink. But then he said to Eliza, when I die, I want you to turn my head to the side. Now, you realize all of us that have seen somebody um, who is dead, they, they always look like they're facing forward. In other words, they're coming out of the casket and catch me, Lord, at some point. But Brigham wants his head to the side. When Eliza asked why to the side, he said, he said that he was, uh, he just wanted a chance to rest. He thought um, that he wanted a chance to rest. The word rest in Hebrew means glory. And that he thought with his head to the side that perhaps the Lord wouldn't recognize him and would give him a chance to arrest for a while. Now, notice in that statement how confident he is that the he has been doing the Lord's bidding all his days. Another thing I found was that people who were always faithful, they seemed to get personal revelations. And the revelations uh, were about Big things, small things, but um, I'm going to share one example. One man mentioned the Doctrine of Covenants was Heber C. Kimball. At one point, Heber C. Kimball had a young man whom he employed, and the young man came to work one day and asked Heber if he could have a new pair of shoes. 
He indicated to the young man that he gave him a, an honest wage and that if the man would save his money, he would have the opportunity to purchase his own pair of shoes. The employee thanked Heber, but that night proceeded to tell the Lord that when it came to an, an employee, that Heber was the meanest, stingiest employer he'd ever had, that all he asked him for was a pair of shoes. Well, the next afternoon, as a young man now sauntered into work, Heber was standing by the gate and had a new pair of shoes. The employee thought, oh, it must be object lesson. At which point Heber said, oh no, my friend, these shoes are for you with the promise that you will never say to my God again that I am the meanest, stingiest employer you've ever had. Now, notice what that shows. That shows that those that are faithful have the opportunity to know that to, and be directed by the Lord to receive personal revelation. I then began to look at my own life and I said, uh, you know, I need more confidence. I need more personal revelation. How can I do that? And uh, I came back again and again as I looked at these men. And I go, it's faithfulness. I also notice that those who were faithful all the time, they continued to receive more and more responsibilities. My favorite goes to John Taylor, who is a born and bred Englishman. I figure you might like him best. Me too. I actually named his son after him. I thought he was so great. But uh, John Taylor, at one point, after Carthage Jail, and uh, he had been shot four times uh, at the time that Joseph Smith was shot and killed and martyred, uh, John Taylor, after that, walked with a cane. And when he crossed the mighty Mississippi River and got to the other side, in that process, uh, what he had packed was lost in the river. With only a quilt uh, being able to be thrown up in a tree, Brigham Young uh, came to him, and uh, John's with his wife, his children, and Brigham Young said, uh, John, it's time for you to be on a mission. John asked, uh, where? And Brigham said, I need you back in England. At which point, uh, John asked, how soon do I need to be ready? And Brigham said, tomorrow will be fine. Now, you know, the impact of that mission had a great personal impact on me because John Taylor is going to come to England and baptize some of my ancestors. Now, uh, what, what if he had said no? But what I found was then if people were faithful, they had personal revelations, they had greater confidence, uh, they received responsibilities sometimes above their what they thought was their ability to fulfill but they said yes and the other thing i found was they had friends now you realize uh, we all need friends it just doesn't matter which age we are we we need somebody that cares about us and somebody that wants to know how our day was and if we need help uh, somebody we could call middle of the night or whatever it is and I found that in every case of those in the Doctrine of Covenants, one of the blessings of faithfulness was uh, their friendships and the gospel. And I actually think it had a lot to do with the service that they rendered together. I personally have found that when I do service with others, I may, may or may not benefit the person being served. But the friendships just seem eternal. Notice I've taken you through one category of the Doctrine and Covenants. The next category is those who were faithful, but they're not faithful. And then they come back, and then not, and then they come back. And, okay, what did I find in their lives? Well, it's so interesting. I found that they didn't receive the personal uh, revelation they needed to move forward. 
uh, at some point, they seemed to lose a little bit of confidence in who they were. They didn't really have the kind of big friends or, or uh, uh, responsibilities. It's like uh, uh, responsibilities brings those friendships. But let, let me give uh, one example and perhaps you'll, you'll, you'll get what I'm trying to say. Uh, one man that falls in that category who was in and out, in and out, uh, was named Thomas B. Marsh. Thomas B. Marsh joins the church early, even before uh, the Book of Mormon is off the press. He's gone to Palmyra, New York, and he's picked up just a few pages that were not going to be printed because they had ink blots on them, and uh, so they were being thrown out, and he picked them up. He joins the church. He moves his family to Palmyra. He's faithful, faithful, even becomes president of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. And at that point, he's about age 36. He takes the entire quorum with him to the east, and they have a very successful mission. But then you look and you say, okay, Thomas, what's going to blow you out of the church? In other words, what's, what's going to cause you to, to change your mind? You've committed, in essence, for six years. And it's so, it's so simple. It's so small. But he and his wife, Elizabeth moved next to George Harris and Lucinda and the two wives decided that they will share the milking of cows with the idea as they do so they can share uh, part of the strippings of the cream so that each woman can make better cheese. Now you realize it's a cholesterol story from beginning to end and uh, it begins bad perhaps and definitely ends bad. As uh, Elizabeth uh, Marsh looks into the situation. She be begins to believe that her friend is cheating her. Thomas looks into it and he agrees. Thomas becomes so angry. He takes the issue to a bishop's court, to the high council with the stake presidency, and eventually to the prophet Joseph Smith. When everyone concludes that, hey, Thomas, if anybody's cheating, we, we think she might be your wife. Well, Thomas becomes very angry. He fights against the church. He leaves the church. And for 18 years, he's out. I decided that I would uh, research Thomas to try and figure out what happened to him during that decade plus. Well, I found he became a school teacher like me, right? And it sounds like uh, many of you. Uh, for Thomas, however, his favorite class to teach was biblical geography. Now, this from a man that had never traveled to Israel or Egypt or Syria, any of those places. And uh, his classroom was not standing room only. Thomas uh, suffered from poverty. Uh, Thomas's wife will divorce him. Uh, Thomas will lose his health and begin to shake. Uh, he gets a form of palsy. And finally, through it all, Thomas decides, you know, I think I made a mistake. Now, it takes a big man or a woman to conclude when we've made a mistake and to come back. Uh, I think some of us don't realize how arms are open and we're so anxious. And we pray for everyone to come back, right? But Thomas decides to come back and uh, he makes a huge decision. He literally crosses the plains and uh, he gets to Salt Lake City and he goes to see Brigham Young. Now, Thomas had been Brigham's, uh, well, president of the Quorum of the Twelve, like M. Russell Ballard is currently president of the Quorum of the Twelve. And Brigham hadn't seen him now for about two decades. And when Thomas came in, at first, Brigham didn't recognize him. And, uh, wow, what's the message there? And uh, uh, in Brigham's mind, he will actually say, Thomas looked like a withered old man. So uh, for me, as I get older, <laughs> what's my message? 
well, keep the faith. Uh, and uh, it's interesting that Thomas will be invited to speak in the tabernacle in Salt Lake City. He will speak about his problems since he left the church. And he will uh, try to explain his palsy by saying that the Lord loved him so much, he wouldn't let him go without a severe shaking. After he had spoken to, to the people in the tabernacle, Brigham Young will stand up and ask that those that could welcome Thomas B. Marsh back into the church in full fellowship to raise their hand. To the credit of the saints, everyone welcomed him back. Now you'd say, well, what did Thomas lose in the interim when he was out? Oh, <laughs> confidence, <laughs> personal revelation, no doubt. Uh, responsibilities to serve, no doubt, friendships along the way. Uh, but when he came back, he was embraced. The third category goes like this. The third category is those that leave the church and never come back. And, uh, you know, I would, as I research them, I'd be going, come on, come on. You know, we were sending missionaries into your area. They're spending a lot of times with what we call people inactive. And, uh, well, we, we want them back. We need them back to help move forward the kingdom of God. But I'm going to just share one man from the Doctrine and Covenants. His name was John F. Boynton. Boynton's a pretty interesting man. He was actually the only college graduate in the original Quorum of the Twelve. He was a scientist by trade. And when he said goodbye to the church, he, he said goodbye to religion forever. It wasn't like he was shopping for a different church. He just didn't want that in his life. Well, John F. Boynton went on to be a very, very famous scientist in his day. You'd say for him, he, uh, he was the inventor of the fire extinguisher. So any of you that have the fire extinguisher, say in a kitchen or perhaps in some kind of automobile, uh, the original one built by, by this John F. Boynton, an apostle, at least at one point. He'd say he also invented the soda fountain. So if you've ever liked old greasy hamburgers and the soda drinks, well, he's your man. He also invented the torpedo, a weapon that guards our shores here in America, guards your shores over there in England. And he's the man. He invented um, buttons that weren't seashells. Uh, he invented special tar roofs. He invented a levee system that when a ship went down in a, the San Francisco Harbor, they used his levee system to pull up uh, the ship then from the ocean floor. He at one point married a woman in a hot air balloon going over New York City. I would like to have been his friend. I view John F. Boynton as a genius in his time. The mere fact that he could invent incredible scientific experiments that could continue to bless our lives uh, 200 plus years later is phenomenal to me. But then if you were to say, okay, Susan, well, what, what did he miss by leaving? I mean, it's obvious. He did wonderful things for society. And I go, oh, yes. I mean, just wonderful things that, uh, you know, I know I couldn't talk. Perhaps you can't. But what did he miss? And I'd say, oh, he had the pearl of great price in his hand. He had, uh, well, he missed temple marriage. He missed families can be together forever. He missed doing uh, baptism work for the dead, for his loved ones. And uh, the crazy thing, I admire him so much, but along the way, he, he lost something that could have made his life even better. Now, the last category 
are those that um, join the church. And along the way, um, something happens. Uh, perhaps they're offended. <laughs> you know, uh, somebody says something, does something. Um, boy, where are those of us that haven't been offended? But uh, then the question comes, is the offense enough to literally leave truth? And uh, I, like you, have been offended. But it's never been enough to disregard my testimony. And so with that, I then began to look at actually a very small percentage of those in the Doctrine and Covenants that, that along the way, something happened. They didn't get a calling they wanted. They were called to repentance by the prophet Joseph. And uh, something happened to them. And uh, they turned their heel against truth. Well, I followed their lives. And I found something pretty interesting. The consistent across the board was they became bitter. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of emotions that we can experience, um, happiness, sadness, but, uh, but bitter. Wow, it just cankered their souls. And um, as they fought against the prophet, they experienced hardship. And so let me describe one man. One man, he lived in Nauvoo. He'd actually been a stake president. Can you imagine that? His name was Alma W. Babbitt. He'd been a state president in Kirtland, Ohio. He moved out to Illinois and lived in a small farming community called Ramus outside of Nauvoo. And he was a branch president at the time of this story. So in January of 1841, the prophet Joseph received a revelation that we now call section 124. And in that revelation, it's long, it tells about the Nauvoo Temple and Nauvoo House, but it mentions Alma W. Babbitt. And in it, Babbitt is told to beware of the golden calf. In other words, don't allow riches to trump, become bigger than your testimony and how you feel about life. Well, when Joseph received the revelation and Alma W. Babbitt read it, he came to Joseph and he said, take it out. In other words, I don't want that said of me. Uh, Joseph refused to take it out. And now the story. Uh, when Joseph was in Carthage jail, the day before his death, his uncle, uh, John Smith, came to visit him. And his uncle, a very faithful man. And when he came to visit them, he asked Joseph and his brother Hiram, is there anything I can do for you? And uh, the, the answer was, Joseph said to them, go, uh, said to Uncle John Smith, go get me Alma W. Babbitt. Babbitt at that time was an attorney. And Babbitt had a license to practice in five different states of the United States. So he wasn't just a casual attorney. He had been one for years. And Joseph said, I want him to defend me when my case comes up in a court of law. Well, Uncle John went to see Alma W. Babbitt. And he said to Babbitt in this ramus very close to Carthage, he said, I've just come from Carthage. And he said, did you know that Joseph and Hiram are in jail in Carthage? At which point, Alma W. Babbitt said, yes, I am very much aware. And Uncle John said, oh, good, that he, uh, Joseph wants you to defend him in a court of law. At which point, Alma W. Babbitt said, Uncle John, you're too late. I've already been hired by the other side. Now, what happens to a man like this? Uh, his life from this point on struggles. And uh, it becomes uh, bitter as he now, now fights 
against the church. Uh, may we not do that? Now, in closing my remarks, so we can get some questions, I'd like to express to you uh, how I have been blessed as a member of the church and um, how it was possible for me to literally move forward. I want to take you to a time in the early 1970s. No doubt many of you weren't alive then. <laughs> I was, and mind you, I think I looked the same, but anybody else would say, oh, no, absolutely not. But in the early 1970s, I'm a single parent. And I'm living in a mountainous area on a dirt road. I have no visible means of support. I have three little children, my youngest a babe in arms and my oldest four years old. I'm attending church and it's a small, uh, small ward, it should probably have been a branch. I'm the gospel doctrine teacher, right? I help out at primary and, and uh, church is a big part of my life. I have many different women, the three years I lived there, that told me they were my visiting teacher. Uh, today we would say minister, right? But no one came to see me. I could only conclude that, hey, they just can't find me. I mean, I live on a dirt road and a cabin and all that. But finally, there was an older woman that came to see me. And uh, her name is Janice Stamayer. You know, she probably won't be recognized in church history books, but she's important to my family. Each one of my three sons have a picture of Janice in their homes. So Janice came and uh, she was about 20 years older than me and we became friends. The most amazing thing is I'd come to church and uh, Janice was saving a place for me and uh, she called me through the week and I don't know, we just, we were friends. And one time she came to visit me and it was obvious she was really sad. And I go, okay, Janice, what's up? And uh, she said, well, I've, I've been to the doctor. I've just learned I could, can't have any more children. And uh, mind you, she had nine. And I'm trying to sympathize, but obviously I, I didn't do a very good job. And finally she said, hey, Susan, you ever had something you wanted and you didn't get. And I thought, oh, I can top her. <laughs> you know, here I am on a dirt road. I have these three little kids, no means of support. I'm just trying to figure out life. And uh, so, uh, but you realize I, I live in a little town that on a sign coming into town says 119 population. And so if you you know, if you top somebody, you're not going to make a friend. And so I go, okay, Janice, let me think. Let me think. What what if I wanted, I didn't get? And uh, finally, I go, I got it. I go, we just need a better library in this town. I go, it's like a closet. And she says, well, do you like books? And I go, I love books, Janice. And she goes, well, why don't you go back to school? And I go, you know, I, I'd love to but I can't afford it. I mean, maybe I could afford school, but I can't afford school and, you know, paying someone to watch my children. Well, it wasn't until late at night that Janice called me and she goes, Susan, I've got the answer for you. She goes, you know how I have nine children. I wish I had 10, 12 and you've got three. She goes, uh, how about if I watch your children once a week and you go back to school? Maybe that's why I really like teaching pathway, right? And so uh, I went back to school. I was the oldest in my class. Uh, you could pick me out like a Waldo. <laughs> Where is she? Where is she? And, uh, but, you know, um, pretty soon uh, I had lots of friends. When it came time to write a group report, I was always selected. And when it came time to complain to a teacher, I was always selected. Well, at the end of a year of Janice helping care for my children, Janice said, how was it, Susan? And I go, Janice, it was amazing. I go, I think when I went to school before I majored in social, I go, uh, you know, it's really starting to kick in. I, 
I, I can understand things. I'm getting it. I think I'm being blessed by the Lord. And I said, you know, I, I'm going to go on uh, to school and it's not just going to be for poverty. I mean, I'm getting a, a real scholarship. And I said, you know, I, I might even become a professor. And I said to Janice, was it as good for you? And she said, oh, no. <laughs> she said, your, your children are into everything. You know, they don't want to sit still. And I go, you don't like that? Well, what's the impact for me? I went on to school because of her, right? I uh, became a professor. My children all went on to school. They also, all three got their doctorates. Uh, none of that would have happened if I had been someone who was in the church, out the church. None of that would have happened if I had been offended along the way enough to say goodbye to my testimony. I'm sure I would have gone on like Boynton and done perhaps some things for society. But think what I would have missed. I'm so grateful that I didn't fight against the church because along the way, think what I would have also missed. Personal uh testimony, personal revelation. Well, everyone, I'd like to conclude. My ancestors came from Birmingham, so I'm pretty close to, to where you're at. I am very grateful for their willingness to listen to missionaries. I am grateful for the wonderful English heritage that they have left me. I am grateful for your time and your willingness to listen to me. I know that Jesus is the Christ. I know our Father in heaven lives. I know he is mindful of you because he has been mindful of me. I know the blessings that come from faithfulness. I am very grateful for those blessings in my life. I, like you, have prayers that seem to still go unanswered. But I know that if we are faithful, the Lord will take care of us, even in a time of pandemics. And I say this humbly in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Um, I'm, I'm just really grateful for Janice right now. The, she was able to help you to, to learn so much and be able to... Um, create your talent to be so amazing to and share it all with us this evening. Oh, well, I don't know how amazing, but thank you. Oh, no, oh, you're my hero now. I, I want to be like you when, well, now, I want to be like you now, but uh, <clears throat> thank you so much. We've got some questions um, that we'd like to share. First of all, I've just heard from uh, the, the state president or his wife, I'm not sure who it is, but they would like to know where in Birmingham your ancestors are from. Um, I, you know, I don't, I don't know which street or that, but, uh, but I hope close, you know, I'm looking at you and thinking, I wonder if we look the same. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, one of my questions that I'd like to know is, um, I know you wrote a book recently about, um, Joseph and Brigham. I did. And I wondered if, if there's any lesser known facts about them that you wish okay. that people knew. Well, um, you, know, you know what? Well, one of the things I think is really interesting about Brigham Young is that uh, he attended only 11 and a half days of school. And so it's almost with irony that the Brig Brigham Young University BYU pathway is named after the prophet that had spent the least time listening to somebody like me <laughs> and so i i think that's interesting i also think it's interesting that the first day literally that brigham meets the prophet joseph uh they go into a meeting and uh brigham introduces himself and as he does so brigham speaks in tongues which you realize is education he's not prepared for that right and uh, as he speaks in tongues, uh, Joseph interprets and says it's the first time he had ever heard a mortal uh, speak the Adamic language. 
And then uh, he, he then said that Brigham has just told me he will live to lead the church. So uh, I think uh, I think of that book on Joseph and Brigham, uh, there would be a lot of uh, exciting discoveries for people. Wow. I didn't know any of that. So oh. thank, you. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, I'm joined. I'm oh, sorry, Lisa, I didn't introduce you. We have um, Lisa Cope, State Relief Society President with us as well, who's helping with the questions. Lisa, your turn. Um, we have a question. Why do you love the Prophet Joseph Smith so much? Uh, I think for me, uh, the Prophet Joseph Smith, I grew up in a home where my grandmother lived with the family. And I wanted her to tell me stories of Snow White and Sleeping Beauty and Cinderella. And I liked, uh, you know, the, the handsome prince and they lived happily ever after. But uh, my grandmother, like Brigham Young, did not have opportunities for schooling. And uh, she would always say to me, I can only tell you stories that are true. And so she would tell me about Joseph Smith. And uh, suddenly, <laughs> well, I really liked those stories. And uh, I, uh, I just couldn't believe that my school friends weren't hearing them. <laughs> and uh, the, he, he just became a hero in childhood. And I've, I've never lost the sense of wonder at what a great man he is. Thank you. Thank you. So with all those books, I wondered, what is the process of starting a new book? <laughs> well, we even talk about that. Okay. Uh, first, you need an idea, and uh, so uh, you know it's just coming up with a thought about it. I'm I'm now working on a book on the miracles of Jesus, and uh, my idea has been, well, there's X number of healing miracles. There's miracles about nature. There's miracles passing unseen. There's miracles of raising the dead. I'm kind of putting them in categories to see see the the differences. I think when we think of miracles, I think sometimes we confine it to health. But there's so many other miracles in our lives if if we look. And anyway, it's been very fun for me. Um, I was thinking back to your book that you've written on M. Russell Ballard. And um, having the privilege of having him in England this week right. um, and watching him on uh, watching him on YouTube so I wasn't even in the room with him but he was in a chapel that I've attended um, and I know how the spirit felt as he walked into that room so thinking on you interviewing him how does that make you feel being in the presence of an apostle of the Lord <laughs> well uh, you know unworthy <laughs> you know we can always say that but um, you know remember what I said about you know the faithfulness you, know, you get that little bit of uh, confidence, but I can truly say that the most consistent as I would interview people, they would say, he can see afar. And uh, the many uh, things he's done from preach my gospel to just serve, you know, has been, you know, his, his idea, it kind of, he's taken like BYU TV where they were just uh, focusing on Latter-day Saints and put it out now to the world and you begin to look look back and say who is that man and he seems so close to the spirit it was a consistent that's beautiful thank you so as an award-winning teacher do you have advice for the rest of us uh <laughs> who are trying our best um, <laughs> how to bring the scriptures to life okay um you know i love being a teacher i mean it's the old saying if you love your students you know you're halfway there but you need to love your students and your subject and um the times i've seen myself falling short is when i'm irritated at a student <laughs> or um, I'm not as prepared as I wish I were about the subject. But it's that, it's the love of both that makes it possible. That's lovely, thank you. Um, knowing all that you know of church history, how has this secured your testimony of the church and Jesus Christ? Uh, you know, 
for me. <laughs> okay. I have found that blessings are in the center of the church. And, uh, um, you know, I, we, we live in a time when people are saying, I have questions about the church, therefore I'm leaving the church. <laughs> and I've had some approach me and I go, oh, that's so interesting. I go, um, I found so many answers, therefore I'm staying. <laughs> and, uh, and I think that um, they give up too quick on something that's too wonderful. <laughs> and uh, uh, that perseverance, whether it's studies or anything else, is uh, real. And enduring is real. And uh, the, the blessings follow. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I know that you've served um, a few missions in Nauvoo. Um, whose house in Nauvoo would you most want to live in? If you could stay wow. there. <laughs> well, you know, obviously Joseph's house, right? <laughs> There's a, a lot of homes that have been restored in Nauvoo and not many were originally standing, you know, at the time. Uh, for me, it would have to be clean, whose ever house it was. <laughs> and uh, when, once I thought it was clean and, uh, oh, well, I mean, obviously Joseph's. Good choice. Great answer. Great answer. Good choice. What's the most fascinating thing you've discovered about uh, during your research? Uh, well, I, I would say the most fascinating is that the research has never ended you know like like for me like others uh i've had a lot of questions about the church but it doesn't mean i'm not going right but uh with these questions uh i years ago took a journal and decided i'd write all my questions rather than be the person in gospel doctrine that goes hey wait a minute <laughs> have you thought of and so uh I found in research that as the years have come and gone, always around Christmas time before the new year, I read over my questions that are still there. And then I go, oh, I can't believe I didn't know that. And uh, uh, anyway, I don't know. I've got to be 80 going on 90%. of They're all, all getting answered now. And it's been really fun. But if I had stopped along the way, it wouldn't have been good for me. Okay. Uh, so research is always as keep stringing it out till you find the right answer. Fantastic. I love that idea. I think we should all do that in January. Write down our questions and see how we how the year answers them for us. <laughs> it, it's, it's been <laughs> fascinating for me, actually. <laughs> so one last question for you. Um, is there a lesser known character that you have come across that has become your fa your new favorite and why? Uh, yes. Uh, there was a woman uh, who uh, at one point in her life, um, well, I don't know, it may take too long to tell that one, but um, okay, all right, Here, here's, here's one, I'm going to do Joseph Smith, and maybe it's because it's Sunday and family comes over, right? <laughs> but at one point in Nauvoo, uh, Emma Smith was approached by W.W. W. Phelps, the very man that wrote the spirit of fire, like a, you know, the spirit of God, like a fire is burning. And, and he said to Emma, you know, I mean, you're, you're feeding so many people that, uh, he goes, I, I think I have the answer. So basically, you know, you could budget and it wouldn't be so expensive. All these people that come to eat all the time. And, uh, so he, he said to Emma, what you need to do is you need to get a table that only seats one person and uh he said that he had read that napoleon bonaparte had that kind of table so when napoleon's soldiers would come and want to eat with him that they would say well i'd like like to have you join me but there just isn't room at the table and uh emma then said back to ww phelps she said my husband is a bigger man than napoleon bonaparte he can never eat without his friends. And uh, I, I just like that. And uh, I've tried to kind of make it my motto too. Thank you. Yes. Much bigger man than Napoleon. 
<laughs> well, thank you so much for all the time you shared with us and, and your wisdom. And it's just yes, been wonderful. Yeah, goodbye to all my new friends. <laughs> you know, you've got a friend and I like to play. <laughs> well, you are welcome to come over to England anytime. Yes, we would love to have you. <laughs> that was one of my questions. Have you ever been to England? You know, I've actually been uh, a few times. I've done those uh, cruises around, actually led some to uh, Preston and uh, some of the old church history sites. You know, so I've, I've done some that way, but never just a personal trip to go and have fun. Well, you're welcome to come here. Oh, thank you. Okay, everyone have a wonderful day. Okay. Thank Thanks, you. Uh, it's been a real treat. Okay. We're Bye. just going to have a closing prayer quickly. Oh, okay. 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 Thank you. <laughs> um, I'd also like to thank um, Bishop Piper for the technology. Um, hopefully we can be joined now by um, Adam Garner from the uh, Canuck Ward. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank thee for the times you've had this evening to learn from Dr. Piper. We're grateful for the lessons we've learned from the people of the past and pray that thou please help to continue to strengthen our testimonies and as we learn about these people we pray that the spirit would teach us that it may be good examples unto thee and unto others in the world as well and we thank you for the time that sister spent this evening with us and please bless her for the time she's taken and we pray that we can enjoy the on this sabbath day in the name of jesus christ amen amen, amen.